Good morning. Thank you all for being here today. I am Council Member Lori Cumbo. I thank you for your patience. In my eighth month, I'm moving a little slower, so I appreciate you being patient today. Uh, good morning. I am Chair of the Women's Issues Committee. Today we are holding this hearing to consider Intro 1610, a local law to amend the New York City Charter and the Administrative Code of the City of New York in relation to offering resources and trainings to hairdressers to help them recognize potential signs of domestic violence in their clients. Intro 1496, a local law to amend the New York City Charter in relation to reporting on certain domestic violence initiatives. And Resolution 1292, a resolution calling upon the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation amending the real property law to allow victims of domestic violence to terminate leases upon written notice to landlords. Domestic violence is a pervasive issue that we need to keep on speaking out about. It knows no face. It has no discrimination. Domestic violence can happen to anyone, no matter your socioeconomic status, your race, or your gender. It can occur a couple of weeks into a relationship or decades later. Domestic violence comprises 15% of all violent crime in the United States. More than 10 million people per year are victims of domestic abuse, while we know that domestic violence has no face, we also know that a disproportionate number of victims are women. Under the current federal government, immigrant women are even less likely to come forward to report incidents of domestic violence for fear of being deported. And when we think about our current administration on the federal level, we understand that this can be an even greater barrier to individuals from our immigrant community coming forward. In a time when women's rights are under attack, where services for victims of domestic violence have not been deemed priority by the federal government, New York City must be a model to champion the rights of our most vulnerable, including victims of domestic violence and their children, who also suffer consequences leading them to be twice as likely to grow up, to become abusers, or to fall into an abusive relationship. In leading by example, we are considering a revolutionary package of bills today which aim to empower victims of domestic violence. Intro 1610 would help provide tools for those who are in a position to help a victim of domestic violence. Research has shown that most battered women never call the police or go to a shelter because they are simply too afraid of the possible repercussions. But they do talk about the abuse they're facing with someone they trust. This can often be a hairdresser. I know for myself personally, I share almost every intimate detail with my hairdresser. Now it's my barber. <laughs> the salon can be an ideal environment for a victim of domestic violence to seek out help because it could be one of the only places a victim is allowed to go without her abuser. Intro 1496 would increase transparency around the ways in which the city is working to combat domestic violence. This bill would provide valuable data that will assist us in targeting and prioritizing servi services to those truly in need. Finally, many victims of abuse feel trapped in the living situation and fear suffering financial penalties or bad credit from breaking their lease. Reso 1292 would call on the New York State Legislature to guarantee that there is safer and faster avenue for domestic violence victims to terminate their leases. This has been a long time coming. As a society, we need to commit to breaking the silence, offering assistance, and changing attitudes that allow cycles of violence to endure through generations. We need to implement policies that not only assist victims, but reduce incidents by educating citizens as to how to break cycles of behaviors and what healthy relationships look like. This is one of the reasons that this council has allocated many millions of your taxpaying dollars to services to help survivors of domestic violence. Today's hearing is just another step in the right direction, which shows that Women's History Month continues all year round. I'd like to thank the sponsors of this legislation, Council Members Rosenthal and Salamanca. We will hear from Council Members Rosenthal and Salamanca shortly. And of course, thank you to the members of the Committee on Women's Issues that are present. I also want to thank committee staff, Council Aminta Kilowan and policy analyst Joan Pavoni. And last but not least, thank you for all that have come here today um, towards the latter part of June. We appreciate your diligence. 
um, and your fight to make sure that domestic violence is an issue that people feel more comfortable coming forward with and we can break the cycles um, every single day. Now I'd like to turn the floor over to Council Member Rosenthal, who will give a statement about her legislation. Thank you so much, Chair Cumbo. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing in your eighth month. <laughs> thank you. I'm not sure that's a, I think that's a first. It might be a first. <laughs> yeah, so thank you for that. And as your uh, co-chair of the Women's Caucus, it's been such a treat over the last year and a half working with you. You never stop, uh, you never stop working <laughs> in thinking about how we can do more to serve the women of New York, and it's an honor to be your colleague. Domestic violence is an issue that has far too long been on the periphery of our public debate. Relationship violence, as opposed to other more public forms of violence, has too often been viewed as a personal matter, as opposed to the sort of system, uh, systemic issue that public policy must address. But we've started to break through that dangerous myth that family violence is just a private matter. When we talk about how the personal is political, this is exactly what we're talking about. The importance of insisting that we recognize our collective responsibility to address even the most intimate of issues. Advocacy groups, including some that we'll hear from today, have taken this issue from the shadows, organizing women and those affected by pushing policymakers to take it seriously. Here in New York, the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence has done extraordinary work tackling this issue with the broad vision and substantive attention that it demands. Each of the three bills being heard today are designed to build on that amazing progress. Introduction 1496 would create new reporting requirements for the mayor's office to combat domestic violence. This administration has offered a number of constructive new strategies with I think more to come from the task force. And this bill will help us measure their progress and commit future administrations to continue this work. Resolution 1296 calls on the state to make it easier for a survivor of domestic violence to break their lease, to leave a dangerous environment. Even when a survivor of domestic violence has made the difficult decision to leave an abusive relationship, logistical questions about concerns like breaking the apartment lease all too often act as barriers to leaving an abusive environment. As lawmakers and everyday bystanders, it is our responsibility to work whenever possible to remove those barriers. And finally, Intro 1610, introduced by my colleague, Council Member Salamanca and myself, um, would require that the mayor's office to combat domestic violence offer resources and trainings to hairdressers to help them recognize potential signs of domestic violence um, in their clients' lives. A salon is such an intimate space, and by empowering the workers on how to help when they see signs of domestic violence, we can help connect people to what can be life-saving resources. And I'm guessing that it's not just Councilmember Combo and I who have had a focus group of one to ask them if this would be helpful. And the resounding answer has always been yes. So let me thank Michelle Lee for her work on these bills. And in my office, let me especially thank Rachel Knowles and Emma Cloyd for their efforts, and of course, Sean Fitzpatrick, my legislative director, um, for all his work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. 
Um, I want to now invite members of the administration to deliver their testimony. I would now like to have the committee council administer the affirmation and swear the witnesses in. Would you all please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Thank you. You may begin. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairperson Cumbo and members of the City Council Committee on Women's Issues. I am Cecile Noel, Commissioner of the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence, OCDV. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the Mayor's Domestic Violence Task Force efforts to raise awareness and provide education about domestic violence and additional housing protections for survivors. I am pleased to be joined today by my colleagues at the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Mock J, the New York City Police Department, and the Department of Consumer Affairs. The Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence, which was established in 2001, oversees the citywide delivery of domestic violence services, creates innovative policies, develops crisis intervention and prevention-based programs, and works to increase awareness through broad and diverse training and outreach efforts throughout New York City. OCDV also operates the city's five family justice centers, or FJCs which provide comprehensive, multidisciplinary, and trauma-informed services for victims of intimate partner violence, sex trafficking, elder, and, and elder abuse in one location. Last year, the FJC served over 62,000 client visits across the boroughs. The New York City Family Justice Center, the largest network of family justice centers in the country is just one successful initiative this city has implemented to address domestic violence. New York City has historically, especially in the last 15 years, been a leader in our response to domestic violence through ongoing and meaningful investments to address this issue. In this administration alone, we have, among other things, opened two new family justice centers, expanded domestic violence shelter capacity, and launched new initiatives focused on public housing and domestic violence, stalking, healthy relationship education for youth in foster care, increased access to mental health services for survivors, and launched a new policy and training institute within OCDV to expand domestic violence education for agencies and community-based organizations. Yet, despite these achievements and a marked decrease in many other crimes in the city, the rate and impact of domestic violence remains elevated. Domestic violence is a significant driver of violent crime, with 19% of the murders, 38% of rapes, and 39% of felony assaults related to domestic violence citywide. Additionally, in 2016, there were over 83,000 calls to the New York City Domestic Violence Hotline for assistance. It is important to note that this data is just a snapshot of what domestic violence looks like in New York City, as underreporting significantly limits the ability to fully understand the scope of this issue. The persistence of domestic violence, even as the city has become safer overall, led the mayor to create the New York City Domestic Violence Task Force in November 2016. It was tasked with creating durable and effective solutions to domestic violence by combining both criminal justice interventions and social service resources to ensure comprehensive and innovative recommendations, co-chaired by First Lady Shirlane McRae and Police Commissioner James O'Neill, and co-led by the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, the task force brought together 120 experts and leaders from a broad spectrum of city agencies, elected officials, community organizations, and survivors to take a fresh look at how New York City responds to domestic violence. The task force working groups maintained a victim-centered approach throughout the process with a heightened focus on marginalized communities, including immigrants, communities of color, and LGBTQ people. The result was a set of 27 recommendations released in April 2017 with a new $7 million investment, 
which aim to both hold abusers accountable and ensure that we are providing smart and effective pathways to safety, economic empowerment, and trauma-informed services for survivors and their children. The recommendations comprise <clears throat> excuse me, four targeted areas that include expanding child, youth, prevention, and intervention, enhancing criminal justice system responses, strengthening New York City's communities, and improving citywide coordination to maximize resources. <clears throat> excuse me. One funded recommendation that received, that received resounding support from across the task force membership was for the Domestic Violence Task Force to continue its operations. I am pleased to share with you that currently we are in the process of hiring an executive director of the task force as well as a team of staff to, in collaboration with MOCJ, oversee the implementation of the task force recommendations and set up tracking mechanisms to analyze and assess program data, outcome, convene members to continue targeted discussions about specific challenges and areas for improvement research current trends in the nationwide field to enhance services and interventions in the city for survivors, children, youth, and abusive partners, and develop additional recommendations to continue to move the needle forward in responding to domestic violence in New York City. We anticipate meeting on a regular basis with the task force membership to accomplish these goals and providing public progress updates on an annual basis. Therefore, the city supports the goals of intro 1496, and we look forward to discussing a version of the bill that is aligned with our existing plan to report on the progress of the city's implementation of the Domestic Violence Task Force's recommendations. Several of the task force recommendations specifically focused on increasing training for targeted city employees at the Department of Education, the Administration for Children's Services, the Fire Department, and throughout Thrive NYC programming. These recommendations also included expanding access to healthy relationship education for DOE students and, and youth served through the Department of Youth and Community Development, DYCD, programming. OCDV, in collaboration with MOCJ, is eager to implement the new training initiatives with the leadership of OCDV's Policy and Training Institute, which was launched, which was launched in 2016, to build awareness, skills, and capacity around issues related to domestic violence throughout New York City. The Institute's training team provides education to city agencies, community-based organization staff to help them better understand, identify, and address issues related to domestic violence. Since inception, the training team has trained over 5,000 individuals throughout the city, including staff from DHS, NYPD, DOE, and DOP, as well as a diverse group of community-based organizations. The Institute's training team of, often partners with experts in, in community-based organizations throughout city agencies to offer individualized trainings for targeted audiences. The Institute also includes the New York City Healthy Relationship Academy, which provides interactive workshops on dating violence and healthy relationships that provide young people and parents with a meaningful opportunity to learn from trained peer educators. Training is also available for staff that work closely, that, that, that work directly with young people. Since its inception in 2005, the Academy has conducted over 3,300 workshops with 60,000 youth participants. In addition to a strong focus on in-depth and comprehensive training and policy work, OCDV also has dedicated staff that conducts outreach and training and information sessions with diverse communities, businesses, educational institutions, and advocacy groups throughout New York City. Outreach is essential to the work of OCDV. We know that in order to effectively respond to the incidents of domestic violence in the city, we must focus on raising awareness about domestic violence, not just during Domestic Violence Awareness Month, but every day of the year. In 2016, OCDV participated in 418 outreach events in all five boroughs. 
one of the industries that OCDV has been focused on for several years and seeks to continue to expand our work with is salons and cosmetologists. From 2012 through 2015, OCDV conducted over 125 outreach events throughout the five boroughs, focusing on hair and nail salons, eyebrow threading shops, and beauty supply stores. OCDV reached over uh, 1,200 hair and nail, hair, nail and beauty businesses to raise awareness about domestic violence tr and trafficking and connect victims to services at the Family Justice Center. While the New York Department of State Division of Licensing Services oversees the licensing requirements for cosmetologists and barbers and beauticians, OCDV welcomes the opportunity and is committed to continuing outreach efforts and providing training in partnership with community-based organizations to staff in this profession and is regularly, regularly seeking opportunities for collaboration. For example, later this year, OCDV will be, par will be participating in an expo for uh, professional cosmetologists through workshops, tabling, and promotional activities to raise awareness about domestic violence for this population mm -hmm. and provide information to create linkages to resources. We have an excellent working relationship with professional cosmetologists in the city and would have concerns about introducing a punitive element to that relationship. We believe that efforts to educate and inform cosmetologists about the signs of domestic violence and the resources available to victims are most effective when they are the result of voluntary collaboration and outreach rather than regulatory mandates. In addition, the Department of Consumer Affairs does not currently license or regulate, co or regulate cosmetologists and is not well situated to enforce a training requirement through the, through the issuance of penalties. In addition to a focus on increased trainings, the task force also put forth recommendations to address the intersection of domestic violence and housing. We know that approximately 25% of New York City shelter admissions are due to domestic violence, and that the incidence of domestic violence can often directly impact a survivor's ability to maintain or retain or, or, or remain in stable housing. At the time of the mayor's announcement of the creation of the task force, there was also an announcement that the Family Justice Centers, in collaboration with the Human Resources Administration and the Office of the Civil Justice Coordinator were going to begin offering on-site housing legal assistance to help, survivors, to help survivors maintain their current housing, prevent eviction and homelessness, and address housing financial related issues and provide increased access to this critical service. One of our recommendations of the task force is for these housing legal services to continue to remain on site at the FJCs. And we are committed to ensuring that these essential services are part of the FJC service portfolio. We understand that in addition to ensuring survivors' ability to advocate for current legal housing remedies available, we also need to continue to explore legislative and procedural mechanisms to provide additional housing protections to help survivors remain in their homes. This is another recommendation of the task force and we look forward to exploring this issue further with our partner agencies. I have highlighted for you several recommendations from the DV task force that are particularly relevant for today's hearing. If you have not had the opportunity, I encourage you to review the 27 recommendations in their entirety and am happy to review in depth any individual recommendation with you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to this issue and I welcome any questions that this committee may have. I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Ben Kalos of Manhattan, the, the only member, the only male member of the Women's Issues Committee. So we're always very pleased to have his voice and his participation and his perspective. I wanted to get started with questions. Outside of the legislation, I wanted to know 
what has been the success of now having uh, five family justice centers and the success of the Staten Island uh, new opening of that particular center? How has that gone? How has that helped in your ability um, to further uh, do preventative work in the cases of domestic violence in the city of New York? In uh, June of 2016, we opened the Staten Island Family Justice Center. And that center has far exceeded in uh, client visits our projected expectation by far. Um, it has only, the opening of that justice center along with the four that we have, have only served to expand our reach out into the community, enabled us to um, really offer more services and really serve a much needed borough, which was Staten Island here. Um, the inclusion of now new services to the Family Justice Center, housing, as I mentioned in my testimony, also serves to expand the reach, also providing more uh, services that, that, that clients who come to the centers really need. We offer comprehensive services, and this is just an, an, another way of doing that. So it clearly has expand, expanded our reach uh, uh, across the boroughs. We talk a great, and I'm happy to hear that because it, it has been an underserved borough in that way and often individuals from Staten Island would have to come to the other four family justice centers. It's important that they have their own center and I'm glad that you have seen people coming forward in that way. Uh, in your testimony you stated uh, domestic violence is a significant driver of violent crime with 19% of murders, 38% of rapes, and 39% of felony assaults related to domestic violence citywide. Additionally, in 2016, there were over 83,000 calls to the New York City Domestic Violence Hotline for assistance. The complication with that number is that when you're doing great outreach, when you're doing the work, you have increased calls. And so in any other a form of evaluating success, you would want to see decreased calls. But this is an unusual situation because it's such an underreported uh, crime that exists with domestic violence that more people coming forward is great, but it's hard to evaluate the success if the preventative measures are taking root. How do you quantify calls from the year before and the year before that? Are the calls going up? Are they going down? How are you seeing the success of the work that you're doing? As you, <clears throat> excuse me, as you said before, this is truly unlike any other, other kind of crime because um, it's, it's very underreported and so that when our numbers are going up, we really view that as a huge success that people are in fact taking advantage, hearing the message and coming forward. The hotline numbers have re remained about the same across the last couple of years um, and recognize that the hotline calls are calling for a number of things. They could be calling for resources, they could be calling for shelter, they could be calling for information. Sometimes they're just calling because they want. They want to know someone's at the other end that can listen to them for a moment and help talk them through whatever they're going through right now so that the calls themselves represent people reaching out for help and we are happy that the city is there to provide that service that can then that can then link them when they are ready to other services within the city I have to do a commercial here what would be that number for those that are watching at home um, if they want to reach out for services, their hotline number, what would that number be? 1-800-473-HOPE, I believe. 212-629-HOPE. Uh, 621-HOPE, thank you. Can you say it once more? All right, let's say it again. 1-800-621-HOPE. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, and then wanted to ask about, we know a great deal that We've been celebrating all throughout the city of New York that crime is down all throughout the city of New York. As was reported last year, um, every form of crime was down in the city of New York with the exception of crime against women. And wanted to know where are we at this current state as it pertains to crimes against women, rape, sexual assault, domestic violence. Where are we in the city of New York where it pertains to that? We as a city are really uh, aggressively implementing policies 
and programs to really address this issue across the board. The task force is representative, I think, of the city's commitment and believe of the city's commitment to really looking at the issue through the broad spectrum. We're looking at domestic violence. We're looking at the intersection of sexual assault and domestic violence. We are we're working with our partners at, at, at MACJ and at NYPD to think about strategies that make sense in this environment that can really provide uh, services and connection for survivors across the spectrum. But do we have raw data or statistics in terms of where we are as far as violence as it pertains to uh, domestic violence, sexual assault, rape, and most importantly, uh, murder as it pertains to women in the city of New York? Good woman. Uh, good, good morning. My name is uh, Mark Morales. I'm the commanding officer of the Domestic Violence Unit. Uh, I've been in Welcome. this capacity since September of last year. Um, I'm happy to report that, that domestic violence crime is down in the city right now. Uh, overall crime, domestic violence crime is down 5.6%. Homicide specifically is down 32%. Uh, domestic Homicides domestic as it relates to women. As it relates to, when we, when we define domestic violence, we include elderly and we include children too. Okay. So overall we're down 32%. Uh, shootings were down 9%. Stabbings were down uh, 13%. And our radar runs are also down by 2.1%. What about as it pertains to uh, fatalities? Uh, one of the things that we noticed is that uh, there had been an increase um, early in earlier years as it pertains to fatalities related to domestic violence. What are the numbers now um, in the city of New York compared to last year? Are you seeing uh, like intimate partner violence? Correct. Uh So overall, we're down 21 versus 31. When it comes to uh, DV fatal shootings, we're down 2 versus 5. When we're down to DV fatal stabbings, we're down 6 versus 15. And intimate partner were, uh, accounts for 38% of our homicides. Can you repeat that one for me once more? Intimate partner homicides account for 38% of our domestic violence homicides. Okay. Um, I, th I thank you for those statistics. What do you attribute the decrease, if you had to say in your professional opinion, what would you say is the, the greatest... Uh, support in the way of decreasing many of the statistics that you just uh, provided us? I, I don't think it's one thing. Uh, I think it's a combination of a few things. Uh, uh, first and foremost, I think collaboration with all the city agencies and advocacy groups, getting the word out, doing outreach. Um, one of the things that we also instituted was a domestic violence uh, recidivist program where we, we, we basically uh, we, we expanded our commitment. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. A domestic violence? Recidivist program, okay. a top offender program. Got it. We basically, um, we want to combat domestic violence the way we do other crime in the city, through precision policing. Mm -hmm. So we have very specific approaches to target top offenders of domestic violence, the worst of the worst. And, um, and we're committed to stop the abuse. And it seems by targeting the people who are committing the most violence, uh, it's, it's very data-driven, it's uh, very targeted, and so far it's working. And, and that approach is working for other crimes in the city. As you know, other crimes are also down. So that approach is working towards domestic violence. The second part of it is home visits. We, we have a very aggressive, uh, that's the cornerstone of what we do. Last year we, we took nearly 280,000 domestic incident reports. And uh, you know, these reports are not just words on the paper. They tell a story. They tell a story of abuse in someone's home. 
and and each officer knows that that each victim, you know, a fellow New, York, New Yorker, is is looking for assistance. So we do home visits. Last year, we were able to visit uh, 90,000 households of domestic violence. And when we visit these households, we we give them uh, we do several things. Uh, we assess the situation. Uh, we, we take pictures, if, if pictures wasn't taken by patrol. When I say home visits, I'm talking about the domestic violence. Let me take a step back. I have 456 domestic violence officers working for me citywide uh, in, in, in the precincts and the PSAs, 86 precincts and PSAs, and they're the ones that monitor and do the home visits. Um, so with that, we did 90,000 home visits last year, and with those home visits, they they have to pick which of the 280,000 they're going to visit. So they prioritize them by felony violence, by stalking, by, by past history, if the offender still lives there, um, if there's any cases where, where they're, um, they're threatening to kill the victim, uh, strangulation cases. Uh, we also last year incorporated on a DIR six lethality questions. These are risk assessment questions that basically um, the kind of predictors of possible future uh, violence in a household. Now, you can't predict everything, but, but, but these six questions specifically lets you know through, through a lot of research that the more hits on these six questions, more hits of yes, that there is, there is a possibility of a, a higher increase of violence. The six questions are, has a suspect ever threatened to kill you or your children? Has he strangled or choked you? Has he beaten you while you're pregnant? Is he capable of killing you or your children? Is he violently or constantly jealous? And has violence increased in frequency or severity in the past six months? And we also ask if there's access to weapons in a household. That's an important question that we ask. Let so, me just, because I'm fascinated by this, that, of this program. What is the... How are you received coming into a home? And what is, your, what is your goal in coming into the home? So is it to, is it to check on the family to see how the family is doing? Is it to put a little bit of a just want to let you know we could stop by any time, so I hope that everything is going the way it should be here. Or is it a, we want to keep monitoring you, we want to bring you resources, we want to bring you help, we want to bring, because I would imagine if you're going into a family's home, just thinking about my own home and all of those sorts of things and how this information would be received, when asking questions such as, do you feel threatened? Do you feel that this person um, could poten potentially harm you or, or the children? You know, I see in real life that acting out in terms of, you know, the man also being like, well, what about her? She's doing this and she's doing that. Could, she could potentially harm the children. She could, and it would seem like it would be a combative situation in terms of how that particular man is going to feel or, or other partner in the home. Right. Our goal is to provide safety and hope to the victim. And we never ask the questions in front of the, the offender either. We always separate parties. But I'm talking about home visits. So this is after, after 911 responded to a call. Right. Within the next day or two, one of my 456 officers citywide will respond and do a home visit to some of these homes to see, you know, what happened. Maybe we could get more information on a domestic incident report to to build a stronger evidence-based prosecution for the district attorneys. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if certain photos weren't taken of injuries or any property damage, we're going to you know, request to take extra photos or any property damage in a household. Um, Do they come in, are they uniformed when they come? They're uniformed, yes. Do they bring any other type of individual with them, like a mental health practitioner or someone else, or is it only the NYPD? Majority, it's the NYPD, but we, we, we did add um, the Crimes Victims Assistance Program. Uh, I believe back in August, there's 29 precincts, 26 or 29 precincts that has two advocates in each command, one specifically for uh, domestic violence and one for other crimes, but they're interchangeable. 
and they're starting with, with training and proper equipment because we want them to be safe, so make sure they have vests and stuff like that. They're, they're tagging along with the offices and doing home visits, too. Okay. So, and, and that program is going to be expanded to another uh, 26 precincts this year, and by 2018, all 76 commands and all the PSAs are going to have the advocates assigned to the commands. I want to get to the legislation, but I'm so fascinated by how this process is actually um, being implemented. Would you say that um, the officers that are in your command, you said it's 456 that work specifically on issues surrounding domestic violence? Yes, that's a combination of sergeants, detectives, and police officers. Do they get some sort of special training that happens either at the academy or does it happen later once they've been assigned to that unit that they receive some sort of special training that assists them in dealing with domestic violence uh, cases? Constant training. Uh, I'll start that all recruits are trained in the academy from the six-month training. Um, my office has also trained all officers that are being promoted to sergeant, lieutenant, and captain. Uh, all the NCOs were also trained in domestic violence, so they could assist in home visits if, uh, if we need them to. Uh, but my offices are always constantly trained. Um, we, we also do a, uh, two big trainings a year, what we call an all-in conference, where I have 400 we had about 500 domestic violence officers attend that, and we went over elder abuse, child abuse, stalking, you know, very topical domestic violence issues. And every October we host a, a, a domestic violence conference in headquarters where we, we have not only our domestic violence officers but the different agencies and, and advocates that we, we collaborate with. And we have some guest speakers and, you know, we, we, we go over some topical DV training on that, too, so there's always constant training. But with these home visits, you know, when an officer goes in, not only do they provide services and referrals, they, they, they create a safety plan if need be. And what I mean by that is, is um, if the offender still lives there, then we talk about an escape plan, maybe have a travel bag ready to go, maybe the victim should speak to a neighbor or a family member, let them know what's going on in the house, so that way you know, he or she's not alone in the situation. Mm -hmm. um, maybe come up with some sort of single, uh, some sort of like um, dialogue or some sort of body language, someone in the household if they needed to escape. Uh, in, in situations where the offender doesn't live there, we strongly advise that they change their phone number, cell number, um, the doors on a, on a lock. If they have a wooden door, we, we recommend a steel door. Uh, we recommend to, um, you know, when they park their car, park it in a well-lit area change wow. routine every day. So we talk about these safety plans, and, you know, I could highlight, you know, uh, we also tell them that, that, you know, let your employer or security at your place of employment know what's going on because a lot of times in stalking situations, an offender will stalk a victim at, at their workplace. And, and I have a little bit of a success story, if I may. Please. Um, we had a, uh, a situation recently in, in March um, at a department store in the city, I'm not going to need an apartment store to keep the uh -huh. victim's, you know, uh, privacy in place. Uh, uh, she was a victim of domestic violence where um, past history, and, and now he's stalking her. He went to her place of employment at a department store, and she feared for her safety. And she, know, she knew that he has uh, carried weapons in the past, carried guns in the past. So with that, she... Uh, uh, she alerted security, security called 911, and the local precinct's domestic violence sergeant and police officer responded to the department store. At that time, he already fled the scene. Um, they got more information for her. The domestic violence officer gave the victim her personal department cell phone number mm. and said, if he comes back tomorrow, have security call 911, you call me direct. It so happens he came back the next day. They got him trying to escape from the store. Oh, my goodness. After a, uh, he, he had a knife on him, but after a, a, um, a debriefing, he, he admitted to having seven more guns in his house, and we were able to recover those seven weapons. So these visits and safety plans are very effective, and, and these are little stories that are out there that you don't always get to hear, but, you know, it, it does happen, uh, you know, quite, quite often. Wow. 
Thank you. I'm actually, in the interest of time, going to open it up to my colleagues and then we'll um, jump right into the legislation, but I wanted to get some background in terms of uh, some of the work that's already being done at this particular time. I'll turn it over to Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair Cumbo. Um, can we just start with, uh, I know you're going to send this over after the hearing, but just for the public, you both ran through some numbers very quickly, and uh, can I ask you to do that again more slowly? I think I'm set up to listen to it now. But I think you were talking about domestic incident reports this year versus last year. When is this year? Is that 2000, year to date 2017 versus that period in 2006? So start me from the top. That's correct. We're talking about January 1st through June 25th. Jan through June of 16 versus 17. Correct. Okay. So ha a half year. Okay. So what are the numbers? So domestic violence uh, index crimes are down by 5.6%. Wait, wait. Domestic violence index. The seven major crimes, um, murder, rape, robbery, burglary, grand larceny, GLAs, and um, assault, felony assault. Thank you. Okay. Those are the seven majors. We're down 5.6%. Down 5.6%. Do you want to say from what to what, or you don't have to, but... What, once again, I'm sorry? From Down from what to what number? It's 5,170 versus 5,478. We're down 308 crimes. Thank you. Other complaints of domestic violence, which includes other felonies and misdemeanors, were down 6.3 percent. That's 29,574 versus 31,569. That's a difference of 1,995. Uh, domestic violence homicides are down 21, 21 versus 31, which is 32 percent. And one second. Um, 21 versus 31. And then so on that one, Commissioner, your number must have been an annual number. Oh, yours was annual. Okay, so on yours, the percentage decrease, sorry, is what? Oh, 50. 32 percent. 32. Okay. Yep. Our shootings are down 10 versus 11 for a 9.1% 9, 9, 9 decrease. Okay. And our domestic violence related stabbings and slashings are down 13.5%. 518 versus 599. Okay. Is there, thank you. And then on the domestic incident reports, we're down 2.7. From what to what? 130,000, 426, versus 134,021. And that's the number, that last one was the number in 16. Correct. Okay. And domestic violence home visits? We did 90,000 this year, uh, last year rather. And this year? I didn't bring those numbers with me. For this year, ninety thousand for the entire two thousand sixteen period. Nine. Ninety thousand. Nine zero. Nine zero. Ninety. Ninety. Yes. Okay, I really couldn't hear you. So ninety thousand in two thousand sixteen full year. Calendar year, yes. And do we know year to date? I didn't for bring those numbers year? with me. Okay. And the DV officers, you're up to 465. What was it? Or, sorry, DV, what should I call them? The Domestic Violence Prevention Officers. Prevention Officers. Um, Currently at 456. 456, but sorry. But that fluctuates dyslexia. depending, you know, if people move on, they get promoted, they get transferred. Sure. And then the precinct fills them in. But I would say roughly about 450. Okay. 
And the previous year? I don't have last year's staffing with me. Okay. So I'd be interested, uh, thank you for going through those numbers. I'd be interested in seeing them over a period of time. Um, so maybe, you know, I don't want to make you do work. However you collect it um, for each of those categories for maybe 14, 15, 16, and 17. Sure. Okay, great. We have that information. Thank we can you. get that to you. And, you know, I'll caution, of course, all of this with the understanding that, you know, you can't read too much into the numbers, right? I mean, you want people to report more. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, it, so that complicates, I think, all of the numbers. Is that a fair statement? It's a fair statement. I bring it up because you talked about training officers on preventing domestic violence or how to de-escalate a situation. Is one of the new training programs more victim-centered? Did you talk about that? Or I think the commissioner did. Is that the training that you're talking about, the new training for the PD, that it's more victim-centered? Well, our training is always victim-centered. Um, when I talk about the domestic violence top offender program, that was more after going the, the worst of the worst, which is the offender-based. Okay. So that's just more of an apprehension tool okay. to identifying the worst domestic violence offenders in the city, and if they're currently wanted, you know, we're going to go after them. Okay. When you... Um if we could just look at the numbers for 2016, 134,000, well, wait, that's a half-year number, and then the full year, the half-year number for DV uh, reports is 134,000, and the full year for DV home visits is 90,000. Can I just, for sake of numbers, here today, and this is all draft, and I'm not going to hold anyone to anything. Um, let's just double up the 134 to call it 260 for a full year. Last year we took 280,000. Right. So, um, of of those, would you say that 90,000 is the subset? Right. That you did. You got 280,000 incident reports and you did 90,000 home visits, by the way, all of which is amazing, so thank you for this. I'm just trying to understand it better. Um, is that, does that mean roughly three visits per home? Are there... Well, so, so we, I'm going to use last year's numbers because we have both sets in front of us. That's right. So 280,000 uh, calls of domestic violence, about 40,000 were unfounded. We still take a, a domestic incident report for unfounded calls. In other words, we get a call of a husband and wife arguing on a corner of Chambers and Broadway. The police respond. They, they look around. They, they look for witnesses. They look for anything. They still complete a de, uh, domestic incident report, and it's, it's unfounded. They complete those on their uh, smartphones. So of the 280, about 40,000 are unfounded anyway. 40,000 are what? About unfounded. Unfounded. Unfounded, meaning we can't. Can't There's confirm. no complainants. We can't confirm it. Okay. Can I just get clarity on that one just so that I understand? So let's say you do arrive and that couple are arguing and fussing and fighting or whatever, and then you arrive and then they say, officers, it's nothing. We're fine. Go, go on your own way. What do you do then? Does that go in the unfounded category or does that go into we have to report something here? Especially if in the situation you can tell it's obvious something that happened, but they don't want to deal with the fact that the police have been called by an outside entity. We, we, we get that a lot because, especially in a public uh, area like in a street, but the officers are trained to separate the parties and, you know, to see what's going on, to see, you know, what was the reason for the phone call. A lot of times witnesses are calling, so we get a lot from that phone call of a, of a witness, too. Um, but either way, we're going to complete a domestic incident report. Now, if the complainant or victim refused to give his or her name, we can't force them to either. 
And, and, and if we believe that the situation, the victim wasn't assaulted, we don't see injuries, we don't see bleeding, and it was a, a verbal dispute that occurred in the street, we're going to take a report for that with or without complainants named on that domestic incident report. What do you do in the case of someone who, I know this is getting very detailed, but you arrive on the scene and someone is clearly hurt, but they don't want to, they don't want to press charges or report it. How does that get handled? Someone's got a black eye, someone's got a bloody nose. We, we have for, for felony assaults, it's a must arrest situation. There's no discretion, even if the victim doesn't want the complainant arrested, the offender arrested, that's a must arrest situation. And misdemeanor assaults, it's, 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 a, it's up to the officer's discretion, but the discretion is we want that arrest made anyway because that misdemeanor assault will turn into something violent in the future. So although the officer has that discretion, even if the complainant doesn't want him arrested, I would say 90, 98% of the times that arrest is being made, we want that arrest made. Okay. I just have to ask, because does that differ from incidents of sexual assault it seems like they may be handled differently in the sense of, right? right? Yeah. This person's got a bloody eye, or a bloody nose, and you've made that arrest. The person does not want to press charges, maybe because they're an immigrant, maybe they fear for their life. Is it possible or are you capable of still taking this and getting a conviction without the participation of the victim um, even though you might have witnesses that would testify in support of what they saw? So I, I could speak to on domestic violence specifically, not, not so much sexual assaults, but what we do is we, we try to build a very strong evidence-based prosecution. So, uh, you know, as, as the commissioner could attest to, many victims do recant, and, and after they make the, the original complaint, they recant and they don't want an arrest made. But if we have the 911 tapes and we have... Um, good pictures of the injury. Uh, we have threatening text messages on her phone, or his phone. And we have, uh, on a domestic incident report, the, the victim is writing the story in his or her own handwriting, in his or her own language. So, so the, many DAs, they will use that as a supporting disposition to, make the, to prosecute the case regardless mm. that the victim is recanting. But, you know, that, that's a great question that you could pose to the DA's office because I would definitely like to see, you know, uh, more prosecution in that area. Thank you, because there is a discrepancy that we've seen um, when we had uh, a presentation to the Women's Caucus um, as it relates to sexual assault and rape, that you can have all of that evidence presented but if the victim does not want to proceed or move forward, that you can have all of that information and it still not lead to a conviction. Right. Uh, I apologize for interrupting, Councilmember Rosenthal. I, um, I think we're going to be inviting you to the Women's Caucus uh, <laughs> to, to come Petition chat. This accepted. has been great. This has been but, really helpful. Um, Councilwoman, if I may clarify one thing with the home visits, because I, I don't want to... We had 90,000 home visits, but a, a big portion of that, we, we have what we call a high propensity and child at risk program. These are households that we identified at, at, at most at risk that has a lot of um, you know, history of domestic violence, and we believe that there's a propensity for um, reoccurrence or re-victimization in these homes. So we have a, 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 a each precinct has multiple um, households on a high propensity child at risk homes. Uh, citywide, we have right now 651 households that are identified as such. And, and these are specialized visits where they go there, they, 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 they monitor the house, they track the house, and, and, and they, they offer any services that they haven't offered in the past or the continuation of offering services. Uh, they might be aware of a new incident that they didn't want to call us for. Mm -hmm. but they build some sort of relationship and trust with the domestic violence officers because these homes are visited almost once every two weeks. So a high propensity home in, in a calendar year hopefully is visited 24, 25 times at least. So, you know, you multiply that by the 620, 651, that's going to be a good portion of the 90,000 home visits. So I just want to clarify that, that not every, every 90,000 was unique. We have, you know, like on a top offender program, we also have 
our top, you know, victims where we, we, we give them very catered and targeted home visits. Great. Yep. So if I could move on to the legislation. <laughs> um, this is so very helpful. But um, And let's actually start with, let's start with this issue um, of homes where the victim might be at risk. Um, Commissioner, you, when, in your testimony about um, Reso number 1292, which would make it easier for victims to get out of a lease, mm -hmm. um, which is something we hear from the advocates that victims really, mm -hmm. that's what they're looking for, and, and the hurdles right now are too high to get out of the lease, and then so they're stuck there. What is the administration, um, that was really the point of this resolution, not, not so much what we can do to help them in their homes, but this is to help them get out of the situation. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, one of the recommendations of the task force was in fact to look at um, housing remedies across the board for domestic violence survivors, including leases. And what could we do to ensure that protections are there to help su survivors in the long run? So yes, we are we're clearly supportive of looking at how we can do that in the city, not only for leases, but um, in any other area related to housing that can offer greater protection. What's the... I'm just looking at it again myself. The cur currently, I think they have to get a judge's order, right, in order to uh, break a lease. Is that right? What's the yes, hurdle right now? I think we can get back yeah, to it. Sure there are some remedies you can do in housing court for this, um, but we don't have the law at hand, unfortunately. So here's the problem, is that when they can't get out of their lease, you know, it becomes the reality of somebody who faces um, eviction, right, from their landlord, and all of a sudden they have a bad record, and, you know, there's this tenant's blacklist going around. Um, so what we're trying to do is avoid the situation of getting that woman on that list so that when she's in a better situation, she can easily find an apartment. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, it sounds like there were no specifics on looking at that issue. Um, well, as the commissioner mentioned, it was one of the recommendations was to look at state legislation. It is largely a state law issue. Um, you know, unfortunately, the, the city doesn't have too much power over over leases and things like that. Uh, but it is one of the recommendations, and we did have participation from legislators in Albany um, to look at this issue and try to figure out what are the best remedies uh, for victims in order to get out of their leases, um, as well as possibilities to keep them in their home safely. Um, that, I mean, that's something that we're also very interested in. Is you know, hopefully not having to flee if that can be uh, done. But that's that's the continued work of the of the task force. Okay. Oh, please, yeah, I want to cede my time to uh, Councilmember Crowley. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you to our chair, uh, Councilmember Cumbo, for having an important hearing. Um, I have a question about uh, the average day of a domestic violence officer. Uh, if you could take me through the day, uh, how the officer spends their shift, um, I'd like to better understand that. Sure, there's uh, quite a few things that they do. Uh, Sergeant, when he first comes in, or he or she comes in in the morning, they check um, what we call is like a 911 log. Uh, to take a step back, every job that comes over as domestic violence has to have a required disposition so we know it's a domestic violence situation. Even if it didn't start that way, if they give a domestic violence disposition, then we know a domestic incident report should be prepared for that call, even if it's unfounded. So 
they, every morning they check the 911 calls to make sure it matches up with a domestic incident report. Because without the domestic incident report, we don't know what, what happened in the prior 24, 48 hours, and you can't proceed the day's work. So that's one thing that they do. The other thing that they do is they input the domestic incident reports into a what we call a domestic violence investigations management system. I'm um, just th I hate to interrupt you, but I might forget to ask uh, once you finish. So when a domestic violence incident occurs, and uh, from the numbers I see from my own precincts, they seem to be the number one occurring incidents of crimes or reports. Say that again. Calls, reports, crimes. It seems to be the number one domestic violence. The number one reason uh, the police go for calls. In your precinct, or yeah. Okay. Domestic violence. I thought it was almost in every precinct. Which which precinct is this? I'm at the 104 and the 102. Okay. I thought that, that it was every precinct. I thought it wasn't just alone. I mean, this is not just a, a woman uh, being abused at the hands of her lover. It, it could be two brothers uh, arguing or um, an incident with uh, a parent and child. Um, but that was the impression I had. It wasn't just my area, that it was citywide. So, so I was just curious to know if at in every precinct at any given time of the day, is there somebody who specializes in domestic violence? Other than somebody who comes in and then reviews uh, the cases that happened the night before or the shift previous. That, you know, that, that, that there could be somebody immediately uh, on call to be dispatched to that incident that has that expertise. If, if a domestic violence officer is working, they're gonna go to that call, but Patrol is responding to those calls first because um, they're in a car already, they're answering the radio, a call comes over like a robbery or burglary or domestic incident, uh, they're going to respond to that call. Okay, and I'm sorry for interrupting you. So if you can go back into that day, they look at the, they come in, the domestic violence officer. Right. They're usually not uh, one that's in a patrol car, right? They, that's their specialty there, um, working with the overall number of domestic violence incidents so that they, they review the incidents that happened when they were not there, and... Correct, so, so they review the incidents, and then um, based on history, f stalking, maybe multiple violations of order protection, uh, other occurrences, they may do a home visit to that household and, and provide any services or referrals, maybe take further documentation, either in pictures or additional information on a domestic incident report, or what occurred, you know, in the last day or two. Um, if, if an offender is present, they're going to make an arrest. Um, an offender is not present, they're going to collaborate with the detective bureau to, to try to provide more information. We, we do ask the victim for very specific questions that has helped us uh, in the past apprehend them, uh, these offenders, you know, and, and we give the responses to those four questions to the detective squad to assist in their apprehension attempts. Um, in addition to home visits, uh, the, transla the, the, the um, domestic incident report has to be put into the, into the database, as I mentioned. Uh, many times, the, the victim's handwritten story is written in another language other than English. So that has to be translated. So uh, that's a process in itself to find someone in that specific language to process. Um, so that's being done because we want to make sure that we get the story right. Um, in addition to that, uh, they're going to visit their high propensity and child at risk homes. Like I said, every two weeks, these, these targeted homes are going to get visits. So it's another part of their function. Um, another thing that they do is, let me see if I'm missing anything here, they, they do a lot of community outreach. I would say each precinct, I, I'm, I'm hoping they do at least two or three, if not more, outreaches a month where they might go to a, a senior citizen center and talk about elderly crime and financial abuse. They may go to a, a, um, a heavily traveled area. It could be a subway stop. It could be a, a community center. Um, they also collaborate with their local advocates in the housing developments. They collaborate with, with Sanctuary for Families. The precincts, they collaborate a lot with Safe Horizon. Um, uh, there's a lot of reporting. Yeah, I, I've seen your officers out, and they do a, a lot of events. I just want to um, 
wrap up my question and just ask about um, when they enter the case in, um, in the lock and uh, they have all the information, what warrants a visit and then what warrants staying in touch with that family uh, and who's overseeing that to make sure that the officer is uh, doing their due diligence to prevent incidents from happening? Sure, sure. so I, I don't want to demonize the, 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 the domestic incident reports, but a lot of reports are taken over an argument over a remote control, maybe rubber disputes. Th those type of situations are not going to warrant much follow-up unless there's a lot of past history in that household. What, what's going to warrant they follow up is if there was a felony violence if like a, a stabbing it could be a uh, it could be a rape it could be a robbery um if there's multiple um if there's stalking involved if, if it's a strangulation case if we have quite a few of those lethality questions which i mentioned earlier checked off yes that's going to warrant a visit um if we know there's access to guns that's going to warrant a visit so there's a multitude of, of uh you know, it's, it's, it's not one thing, it's, it's quite a few things that has to be occurring in the household because we have to pick which of the 280 or 240 founded domestic incident reports we're going to visit. So we've got to, you know, choose wisely with that. It's, so it's very targeted and focused how we, how we do the home visits. That, that is important. And again, I want to thank the chair and my colleague, uh, Councilmember Rosenthal and Councilmember Cumbo, for uh, having this important hearing. Women uh, who get killed are more than likely to be killed over 90% of the time at the hands of a lover. And that happens too often. I mean, it should never happen. We, we want to make sure we do everything we can as a city to prevent incidents like this from happening. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, if I could just sort of follow up on this uh, notion, I, I really want to stick with the resolution for just one more second. We hear from advocates that there are thousands of cases of women who just can't get out of their lease. And right now they need an order of protection. They need to be able to prove they've gotten an order of protection in order to get out of their lease. And sometimes, as you know, this is all very uh, nuanced, these situations. And oftentimes just getting the order of protection can incite more violence. So what this resolution asks the state to do is to uh, change a law so that a police incident report would be sufficient for breaking a lease. Um, in, for, for really either of you, do you see that, do you see that could be relief? Are, are you seeing those situations or is this something that, that you're not as aware of? In the Family Justice Centers, um, our housing attorneys really work with the client to achieve a successful resolution. In terms of this bill in particular, we feel that um, it would be important to take a look at all of the remedies that we might be able to move forward on to be able to achieve the goal of, in fact, creating safety for the survivor and being able to do uh, just what you're saying, breaking the lease, as well as other things that could fall within that same domain. And, and what we're looking at right now is sort of models in other jurisdictions of how to do this and really trying to fight the right balance for, for survivors. Um, so I think this is one possibility. There's probably other possibilities out there, and or we're sort of eager to look at what the landscape is and to be prepared for the legislative session for next year. So what are some of the other remedies? I know people have argued that a social worker's letter mm -hmm. should be sufficient for breaking a lease. What else are you seeing out there? I think there's a lot of different kinds of evidence you can use. I, I, ultimately, it's, you know, you have to look a little bit of a balancing, right? Because it, it, it has to be, you know, easy for victims. Um, you know, you have to make sure it's also sort of legally viable. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of different models out there. I don't have the full, you know, 50 state survey at my hand, um, but we're happy to talk to your office, you know, after the hearing to go over some of the things that are particularly attractive to us. You want to add to that? I really don't look at the lease situation, so I can't, you know, uh, comment on that. Do you think that the police incident reports are meaningful enough to tell a story, 
to be able to tell the story of a, a woman being in an abusive situation. Absolutely. Um, but it, it, I, I wouldn't say any domestic incident report. I, I think you have to build some parameters with that because, as I stated earlier, we, we would take a domestic incident report if they fought over remote control. So I don't know if that's the parameter you want to use or you want to say that's, that's a... But of course it would say that in the incident report, right? right? So yes, that yes. no one would be able to go to court or be able to break a lease because they fiddled with a remote control. Correct. Obviously the content matters. Absolutely, and that's, right. that's what I would... So what I'm asking is in a situation that's thorny, right, is seriously... Um, scary and the police write that in the incident report do you think that so think of your worst case scenarios do you think that those police reports should be enough short of a court order of protection right they don't have that but would a police incident report be sufficient to tell the story Uh, I, I think I think that, y y as the chief said, that those reports are fairly accurate. That, in the sense that an officer coming to the scene of one of these incidents is going to record what the victim is saying. Now, to to the extent that that could be used to better serve victims of domestic violence, I mean, I think that would be a good thing. Okay. But, My you know, if, I, if I also. You know, may I also say, remember, it's, it's the victim's words on that, so you don't, you don't want the offender to get a copy of that either and not have privacy issues. It's not part of the resolution. Okay, okay. And might I also add that, I, you know, that uh, survivors sometimes don't call the police, and we know that, right? They don't call, but they could be seeing a service provider. I think that all we're saying is that, that the intent of this is something that we support and we would love to sit down and really look at the best way to achieve that. That's, I think, all that we're saying, but because I think there could be multiple ways and other things in addition to this that we might be able to um, achieve through our collaboration on that. Sorry. Real quick. Okay. So, um, real quickly on the thank you very much. I appreciate that. I look forward to working with you. On the um, DB Task Force report, do you sense, in addition to the things we've talked about in the bill, you, you get the sense there might be additional things you'd want to report on as well to include yes. in there? Yes. Can you give just even a little bit of an example? I think as we begin to, um, one, hire the staff that will be uh, um, um, really supporting the task force work and the recommendations, we will be looking at the data points across the board that we need to collect and would be happy to discuss as we move this forward, what are the data points that you would like to see in this that we'll be reporting on that would be important? I, I think for us it's important to show that we're reaching communities, showing success in those interventions, and I would hope that those are some of the same things that you would like to see of as course. well. And so together we can craft something that really makes sense once we bring on the staffing for the task force and really begin to look at the metrics of each program. There are 27 different recommendations, and the metrics might not all all be the same for every single one, depending on what it is. So in one where we're looking at child trauma, for example, um, the metrics there might be a little bit different of what we're collecting versus uh, something that's based on education and training. Of course. Okay? But um, one of the metrics, interestingly, is timing between having a vision and reality. Right. So sounds like you have the budget mm -hmm. for staffing. Yes. But if we don't fill those positions, um, we will still be collecting and we will, we're, we're still going. We won't be moving forward and our goal is to have transparency around what we're doing as well as what we're collecting with you and, and the public overall. In terms I, just, of the, the, the I guess I'm saying I would hope that fully staffing this unit doesn't keep us from uh, writing a good piece of legislation with real no, specific no. goals that are different for each area. 
We, we, we agree with that. You're ready to move we forward agree. now in terms of working on it. We don't have to wait until you're fully that staffed. Is correct. That is then correct. lastly on the, um, the hairdresser bill, um, you talked about not wanting to have a punitive uh, part you know, aspect for the, mm -hmm. um, the hairdresser. What do you think some incentives could be? Um, I would love to give that some thought and get back to you, but I do think ultimately being able to um, maybe structure something where um, I don't know, I, we're giving them more of our resources than we are right now, um, linking them up with community partners that are readily available, even outside of the Family Justice Center rubric in my office. There are many, many community partners who would love to be a part of that relationship and have them feel like there's a real partnership within their own community, with folks who speak their own language, who can come in and actually do that work. I think that would be a great thing to be able to offer. With, Is you that know, something the that the task force would have the capacity to do throughout the city? Um, I think that with the, the, the partnership of the many agencies that we have, yes, I think they would be very willing to talk about what that would look like. Do you yeah. think that, um, the, that uh, someone in government would have the capacity to do the appropriate training? I think that our office definitely has, um, does this kind of training. It's, it's unclear to me of the overall number. I, I mean, I gave a number in, in, um, in my um, uh, presentation here that's 1,200 over the scope. Now, now the, the number of cosmetology and nail and all of those salons, I don't have the number and I'd have to evaluate what that is against our own capacity as a, as a government entity that does a lot of this training, right? That does a lot of the training, both for city entities and what that would look like out for in the, the licensed, Thank you. For the licensed store, mm -hmm. the stores that have retail outlets that have licensed cosmetologists and hairdressers and barbers, mm -hmm. Does DCA know how many of those there are? Um, we have DCA. Okay. Hi, Council Member. My name is Casey Adams. I'm from DCA. We don't currently license salons and barbershops. Right. The but do you track, do you know how many there are in the city? I understand you guys don't. It's mm -hmm. a state responsibility. So we don't track that, but it is our understanding that some data may be available from the state entities that do uh, license barbershops and uh, cosmetologists. And when, so do you, so you don't have a sense yet of, you know, if you're hitting 50%, 80%, 2% of the people out there who could be helping? Could you clarify what you mean by hitting? I don't know, the work that you do in outreach. So to clarify, um, DCA does inspect uh, salons and barber shops, along with many other types of retail establishments for certain requirements to which they're subject, including, for instance, uh, gender pricing for services, as well as the posting of refund policies um, and accurate prices. When you do the inspections, do you know that you're inspecting a beauty salon when you check it off in the box versus a shoe shiner? The types of establishments that we are inspecting are generally recorded on when we design the inspection route, but we don't have an, our enforcement staff um, here today, so I can get too much. I guess into the, the details. question would be to DCA: Do you can you using your the inspections you do for the things that you you are required to do, uh, which you just listed here, uh, using that information? Could you identify the number of establishments that provide this service? We, we don't have a picture of the complete universe of salons and barbershops. We do know the number of establishments that we have uh, inspected over a certain year and the number of violations that we have issued. Uh, the legislation that's being discussed here today does speak directly to cosmetologists as opposed to salons and barbershops. So uh, there is a little bit of a distinction between the individual cosmetologist and the establishment at which they work. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chair Combo. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal, and thank you for the legislation you've put forward. <clears throat> Just want to get right to the, so that we can have it on record. Uh, is the administration in support of intro 1610, a local law to amend the New York City Charter and the Administrative Code of the City of New York in relation to offering resources and trainings to hairdressers to help them recognize potential signs of domestic violence in their clients? We are in support of training. We have concerns about uh, our um, mandate as well as a punitive piece to this legislation. That is our concern. We believe in training and, and want to do as much of that as possible. Now my question with that is in terms of the punitive nature of it, is it that during the licensing process this training would happen and it would be a normal part of any aspect of their training in order to get the license uh, that they would need in order to practice cosmetology? Uh, so again, the licenses for cosmetologists are, li are issued by the state of New York through the Department of State. So the city uh, and DCA specifically doesn't have a role in designing the training programs that they need to attend in order to receive that license. So where does the discrepancy in that and the punitive nature of this legislation, where do they meet? So our concern is centered on the fact that DCA as an agency doesn't currently have a regulatory relationship with a cosmetologist. So the first point of contact that the cosmetologist would have with the city of New York and with DCA specifically would be that they would receive a fine from the agency for failing to attend a training. I see. Now, would this also extend to, because I don't understand the, um, the licensing of these, does this also is extend to barber shops? Uh, my understanding is that barber shops are licensed pursuant to state law by the City Department of Health, but I can't speak on their behalf here today. Does that go under cosmetology? When we're talking about cosmetology, do barbers go under that, or do they go under a separate designation? The distinction is between the place of business and the individual practicing the trade. So cosmetologists as individuals are licensed by the state, and there are separate licensure requirements for barber shops as establishments that employ those people. Because I think that this legislation should certainly um, be extended to barbershop owners as well um, and practitioners because hair changes, styles change, and women are going to barbershops also now. And I also think that from living on both sides of that world, I see that um, it's really an excellent place as well. I used to go to uh, a Dominican salon to get my hair done, and that was one kind of conversation. And now that I go to a barber shop where they're mostly men, I get a whole different type of perspective and a different type of advice um, when I go there. And so a lot of women, particularly women of color, are also... Uh, getting their hair done in a natural way, and so that's also a place. But what I do find is that many men go to barber shops for the purposes of having the same discussions we do when we go to hair salons. So it's also a very, um, it's also a very safe environment for many men to talk about relationships and issues that they're facing in relationships, and a barber can often be someone who can speak to someone reasonably um, about situations of domestic violence or relationship disputes and would want to see that be a major part of how this whole discussion is happening. Uh, certainly I would say I've been part of some lively conversations or heard lively conversations when I've gone to men's barbershops, council member. Um, how much expertise do you believe would be needed to implement these trainings? We, we have already, um, uh, on a voluntary basis, worked with uh, some of the uh, nail salons and hair salons and left information, as have many of the domestic violence partners in the community in terms of outreach. It is a normal part of an outreach effort. And so in terms of just organizations and or agencies like ours really steeped in an understanding with a victim-centered approach, understanding the issues of domestic violence, I think would be wholly equipped to be able to do training and offer resources in those environments. 
Are you familiar with other jurisdictions that are offering such trainings and resources to hairdressers? So uh, we know that, for instance, Illinois has a state law that requires um, cosmetologists to attend uh, domestic violence training similar to what's been discussed here today um, as part of their licensure requirements. Uh, that is, I think, closer to what you had described earlier where the cosmetologist simply has another hour of training that is added on to what they're already required to attend pursuant to state law. Uh, so we know that that model exists and has been effective since January of this year. Um, and we're also aware that Colorado has contemplated a, a similar scheme. Um, again, we would emphasize, we DCA would emphasize the distinction there is that the, those uh, schemes are enshrined in state law as opposed to um, local law. And we do already have a, a comprehensive scheme for licensure um, at the state level here in New York. And maybe you both could answer this, and this will be my final question on intro 1610. Uh, has there been a, a, mar a marketing campaign that would um, distribute on a regular basis? We know where the hair salons are, the nail salons, the barber shops. Is there a regular marketing campaign that comes with posters, that comes with flyers, brochures, a business card, something where... Uh, that licensed professional can already say, you know, we're having this conversation. Maybe you should check out a family justice center. I have a card right here for you. You know, that's all I'm going to say on that. Something that would allow an individual just to have the information at their fingertips if they just, if it's well beyond their level of expertise. All of our outreach efforts includes leaving material about the Family Justice Center, about the services offered, uh, cards, just as you've mentioned, um, in different languages as well. Um, and for our community partners who also do this work, they also leave their material there. So again, you don't have to have the expertise. You simply have to be able to say, here, I think this is a resource that might be helpful to you. And all of our outreach efforts, be it in salons or, or uh, nail salons or any other venue, will include leaving material materials about our services. I think that's great. I would just say I go to my fair share of salons and barbershops and nail salons. I just haven't, maybe because it's not what I'm looking for, I just haven't seen that presence yet. So I'd like to talk with you more to see how we can make it more robust because that is a very fertile place for us to be able to have that type of campaign implemented. We agree, and I look forward to having that conversation with you about how we can strengthen and do more uh, so that you'll see our materials in your barbershop. I don't want okay. those at home thinking that I spent all my time in nail salons and <laughs> hair salons, but I'll turn it over to Councilmember Member Real Rosenthal. quickly, it sounds like the hiccup here, you have all the material, that's not the issue. Um, it sounds like the hiccup is getting the list of places that could benefit from this and being able to being able to track have we hit all of them so the first question being does DCA have that list sounds like the answer is no it, again, am I correct you're correct salons and barbershops again are not licensed or registered with the city except with the exception of barbershops pursuant to state law through the Department of Health so we don't keep a comprehensive list. Right, so let's start with, as a first step, what you do have. Let's start with seeing that as we move forward in, in thinking about this as a city together. Let's start by seeing what you do have and, um, and then thinking about sort of side by side, have we hit all of those locations? Um, it's one approach to doing it. I'm sure there are other approaches, and you're doing a great job. But similarly, you know, that material is so great. But when I walk in to get my hair cut, it's not there. When I get walk in to get the, you know, my nails done, which is not frequently, um, it's not there. And those are opportunities that are so ripe. Um, I think that's the whole point of the bill is that we don't know what we're missing, we know we're missing a lot. So certainly we'd be happy to have a conversation with your office and of course to have a conversation mm -hmm. with our colleagues about what data we do maintain uh, would be useful to getting that information where it needs to be. 
And similarly, what could easily be changed on a form or data entry in order to get the information we need. Again, right? we're happy to have a conversation with you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to come back to 1610 with one other question, but I want to go on to 1496. Is the administration in support of intro 1496? Um, in terms of 1496, yes. we support the reporting and look forward to aligning the legislation um, of our work of, of, of the DV task force with this bill. Have the findings of the Mayor's Domestic Violence Task Force impacted the operations of the Family Justice Centers or the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence already? Some of it you outlined. Mm -hmm. um, can you go a little bit more into detail in, in terms of the findings of the Domestic Violence Task Force um, and how it's impacted your work already? Um, certainly in terms of the 27 recommendations, and I think I outlined in my testimony mm -hmm. that the, the four major areas of work that we will, that the recommendations have fallen into are really um, one about how do we expand, and, and, and um, we have recommendations in there that really speak to expanding youth prevention and intervention work. How, how do we do that better? I think you mentioned too that um, also that we know that children who witness violence, who are around violence, are much more likely to be uh, perpetrators or victims themselves. So intervention early on is important. We know that uh, thinking about children, are, our youth are engaging in relationships and how do we uh, promote healthy relationships? How do we uh, give them or talk about the behaviors that they need to have the boundaries, the respect within that relationship early on? We are also thinking about um, um, another category or, or targeted area will be enhancing criminal justice. How do we align our um, district attorney's offices in terms of their processes and procedures? How do we think about both um, ab abuser prevention programs and probation and what role they play within this whole arena? And how can we strengthen that better? How can we um, uh, make some of those programs a little more trauma-informed and much more responsive to the communities that they happen to serve? Um, we're also talking, uh, we're, we're also looking at how we can strengthen communities. Um, we understand that in this political environment that often uh, 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 survivors may, may not choose to come to a family justice center and may want to seek services from a trusted entity within their community. How can we help that trusted entity understand domestic violence as well? It might not have to do with domestic violence. It might be a feeding program. How do we help that feeding program also understand domestic violence understand some of the remedies that are available to survivors who are in fact immigrants and also experiencing domestic violence and um, and then finally maximizing our resources thinking about how we can coordinate better across agencies to to be able to have the same definition when we're all talking about the issue mm -hmm have similar numbers, be able to strategize, not just in our own little agency, but across agencies. A survivor is touching so many agencies in the course of really pursuing justice. And if we can do that better, I know that we, uh, we will have better outcomes for that survivor. Let me ask you, this is the number one question that always comes up in so many of these conversations in town halls. Um, I see representatives from Connect here, uh, Quentin Walcott. What types of programs are available for batterers? That's a question that constantly comes up and an issue that um, we greatly want to tackle because we want to break the cycles, and breaking the cycles has everything to do with um, programs that are established and created uh, for the batterers. And I'm, as I'm hearing all of the testimony from all of you, um, it has a lot to do with how do we get help for those individuals that are um, perpetrating the, vi the violence that we're seeing. Yeah, so uh, we, we have the same concern, I'm sure, as you do. Um, there really is a dearth, I think, of, of programs for batterers, and not a lot of it works that's out there, we know. Um, so one thing the task force has, uh, that's a lot of time, is, is discussing sort of what are the various models out there that we think can do a good job. Uh, one area that's a little bit more sort of criminal justice involved than some of the other uh, options is, is utilizing probation. 
Uh, probation has a long history in other jurisdictions of working very closely with batterers uh, to both connect them to services and in the event that they do reoffend, to do sort of swift and certain sanctions in order to sort of have an immediate effect on that behavior. Um, so the task force was given funding to um, expand probation and to have a, a dedicated unit there um, that's devoted to, to probation. And we brought in some national experts in order to advise us. Um, a lot of buy-in at probation as well. You know, the commissioner is, is, is in pretty much every meeting on this particular topic. Um, so a lot of excitement there. But we're definitely not done. Um, I think there's a bit, there was a lot of discussion during the task force, and I think it, it merits further work on other models, more community-based models, uh, restorative justice models um, that we see sort of sprouting up in other places, uh, but are still still kind of too early to tell how they're going. But I think the city wants to be an innovator there. Um, so, so a lot of work to be done, I think, in that area. Where do you see, this will be my last question on 1496, where do you see success in New York City in terms of programs for batterers? And where do you see nationwide models that are effectively working um, that we should be looking to to implement in the city of New York? Because I feel that that is, that is the heart and foundation of the conversation that we're having here today. We, we, we have to make sure that individuals that are um, perpetrating this level of violence don't just go on to new relationships where those issues still have not been addressed and you see it happening time and time again um, where someone gets in a new relationship but it's already been documented that they had a previous history of this in relationships prior. Yeah, and I think that touches on sort of part of what we see in domestic violence is, you know, things start out, they can start out kind of low level and then they can quickly escalate and everyone always thinks, oh, well, why didn't we do something at the start when we saw it? Um, so, you know, I think, not to repeat myself, but I think probation does have a lot to offer. You know, we all actually together went to Westchester, who has sort of one of the better models of probation in the country. Um, and it's a very victim-focused uh, uh, model. So in addition to doing the supervision of offenders, they do a lot of connections uh, in helping um, uh, victims access the services they need. And actually, some of their probation officers are specifically designated as being, you know, for victims, uh, which I think is different than how we normally think of, of a probation department. Um, so that's one. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting, we were luckily uh, blessed to have B. Hansen, who uh, was the executive director of the task force, um, and prior to her work on the task force, she headed the DOJ's uh, Violence Against Women office, um, and was really charged with investing in sort of innovative models across the country. Um, she's very big on restorative justice, which I think is sort of getting a lot of um, sort of more attention. It's historically been kind of a, a difficult topic in DV just because of that victim offender dynamic. Uh, but there's a lot to be done there, I think. And so we're, we're looking at restorative justice sort of as a, as a key area for possible expansion going forward. And this is the final question. Rather than tackle um, this issue, and this is going back to 1610, um, rather than tackle this issue as related to cosmetologists licensed by New York State, why not view hair salons as businesses of New York City and in the same way as they are visited to check on whether they post refund policies or have fair pricing, et cetera, can we not also check whether resources are being provided to domestic violence victims? Can we look at it as a city issue versus as a state issue the same way we do for many initiatives that we roll out? Uh, Council Member, as I mentioned to Council Member Rosenthal, we're always willing to talk to you about how our resources could best be used to combat this problem um, and how we could best work with our sister agencies. As I mentioned, it is um, much closer to our normal operating procedure to be able to check for posted signs or disclosures of required information. Um, again, I would emphasize that salons and barbershops, while they are subject to certain city laws, that we do inspect for compliance with. They're not required to maintain a registration or a license with DCA at this time. But again, we are open to having a conversation about, how, about other uh, approaches and how our existing tools could be leveraged. Okay, thank you. Yep, we're gonna hear uh, from Council Member Rosenthal and then we'll end the testimony and then we'll begin to hear from the advocates. If I can just say, I mean, I wanna thank everyone for coming today and your preparation. We're doing a lot of work. There's no question about it. You know, in my mind's eye, this is another one of those situations where we're looking at this issue from an agency perspective instead of from the perspective of the victims. And I think what this package of bills tries to get at is say, 
So let's try to look at it from the victim's perspective. What do they need from government? And is government doing all, it's, all it can? And that's what this package of bill tried to achieve. Um, and I really appreciate your saying that you'd be happy to work with us as it moves forward. We appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony today. We appreciate your honesty and frankness, and we look forward to continuing to work collectively uh, so that we can end and break the cycles of domestic violence in our communities. Thank you so much. If the agency could make sure um, that someone remains to hear the testimony of the individuals that are coming, that would be preferred. I'm going to bring forward Diane Johnston from the Legal Aid Society, Jay Young Kim, Urban Resource Institute, Marlene Requel-Emmy, the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Center for Elder Abuse Attention at the Hebrew Home at Riverdale, and Josie Tonelli, New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. When they all get. I understand. And I apologize, we're going to have to do a three-minute clock on the testimonies, uh, followed by questions. So we will begin um, my right, your left, and we'll set the timer. And if you could just introduce yourself and then to present your testimony. There we go. Press the red button. And bring it closer to you. Yep, there you go. Hi, good morning. My name is Marlene Requelme. I'm the public health specialist for the Weinberg Center for Elder Abuse Prevention. Thank you to the chair's person and the members of this committee for inviting the Weinberg Center to address you as you consider a law to amend the New York City Charter Administrative Code of New York to mandate hairdressers to be trained on recognizing potential signs of domestic violence and to provide resources when appropriate. The Weinberg Center, the first comprehensive elder abuse shelter in the nation, was launched at the Hebrew Home at Riverdale by River Spring Health in 2005 to provide emergency shelter for victims of elder abuse living in all five boroughs of New York City and to increase professional and public awareness about elder abuse. All of our clients are acute elder abuse victims forced to leave their homes because they are unsafe due to ongoing or imminent danger. Elder abuse is a public health issue that has been characterized as a chronic health condition that affects one out of 10 older adults living in the community. Research has shown that regardless of comorbidities, victims of elder abuse have a 300% higher risk of death than those who have not been abused. A victim of elder abuse is also more than twice as likely to, u to use a hospital emergency room and to be admitted to a nursing home. Elder abuse victims are often hidden and isolated by their abusers, and without a trained community network, they remain invisible. Similar to the 32 BJ Building Service employees, including doormen and City Meals on Wheels volunteers, the Weinberg Center team has trained to recognize signs of elder abuse. Hairdressers are a resource in the community who may be one of the few, if not only, contacts older adults have outside their homes. One of the most salient features of elder abuse is that victims are often isolated. Friends, family, and intimate partners pass away, children move for school or work, and older adults' mobility may be restricted from visiting loved ones. Cognitive impairment may also be a factor which might affect an older adult's ability to make a disclosure or to report. Most people don't know about elder abuse, so they may not think to pay attention to the signs or symptoms that they may normally pay attention to in younger victims. Analogous to support groups, hair salons also become a safe space where women can sit among other women and confide about their lives as they get their hair done. Often hairdressers will hear anecdotes or com comments that hint at abuse or see a bruise in an unlikely spot. Without proper training, hairdressers may not feel comfortable to provide resources or know what to say. 
In the Weinberg Center's experience working with victims of elder abuse over the last decade, by the time they come through our doors, they have usually been seen by a variety of professionals in the healthcare, legal, social services, and law enforcement fields over an extended period amount of time. It is often the inaction of these professionals that has allowed the situation to fester and escalate until the victim must take the drastic step of having to leave their home to seek safe shelter. For these reasons, it is of utmost importance to, ma to mandate at least one hour of training every two years to the hundreds of thousands of licensed cosmetologists in New York City. Hairdressers already give advice, a friendly ear, or suggestions to their clients. Considering one in four women experience violence in the hands of a partner in their lifetime, it is probable that these victims have spent time talking with their hairdressers already. With New York being the only state in our country that has not yet implemented some kind of mandating reporting regime, hairdressers have an essential role in intervening when elder abuse is suspected as no one else is legally required to. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you for your time. You. Um, and we'll follow up with additional questions. Okay. Next. Good morning. I oh, make it closer. Good morning. I'm Josie Torielli. I'm the Assistant Director of Intervention and Best Care Programs with the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. Hereafter, I'll call us the Alliance, and so it's a long name. Thank you to the Committee on Women's Issues for allowing us to address you on these important subjects. The Alliance supports legislation that will reduce barriers that victims of intimate partner violence and sexual assault face when accessing the services they need and encourage you to consider how intimate partner and sexual violence intersect. The Alliance supports the dissemination of information and the removal of obstacles that will allow more people to act in response to domestic abuse and sexual assault. Often, the link between intimate partner violence and sexual assault goes unaddressed. As the City Council considers these bills, the Alliance strongly urges you to consider the intersection of these issues. It is estimated that 25 to 55 percent of women in the United States experiences physical domestic violence and also experience sexual assault by the same partner. Those experiencing these multiple forms of abuse are prone to longer lasting trauma, increased financial dependency on the perpetrator, and safety issues. They are even more likely to be killed. Furthermore, we ask that the Council consider the research that disclosures of sexual assault are more likely to occur with informal support sources, especially if the perpetrator is known to the victim. Intimate partner sexual violence creates additional barriers to reporting given the many myths and misconceptions around this issue, creating a greater need for available resources. In cases of intimate partner violence, abusers may monitor their victim's daily activity and limit their movements. This creates a significant barrier to someone accessing the services they need to potentially escape the cycle of abuse or to mediate its harms. In cases of sexual assault, victims may feel more comfortable disclosing to a trusted source rather than a formal structure. Visits to a salon may be one of the places where victims can find respite. Long-term relationships are established with these professionals, creating a safe atmosphere for conversations with people they trust. Therefore, we believe that the goal of supplying appearance enhancement professionals, hereafter AEPs, with the tools and resources to adequately respond to disclosures of sexual assault and intimate partner violence is extremely important. These professionals could be a crucial link to services and support for people experiencing intimate partner violence. For this reason, the Alliance is very supportive of Intro 1610, which would provide education and training for AEPs in order to adequately and positively respond to their clients who disclose. As in the previous testimony, we asked the City Council to consider this concept with thoughtfulness about implementation and impact. One consideration would be the financial burden on professionals who would be mandated to receive this training in order to maintain licensure. This can cause undue stress on this professional community. A second consideration would be in implementation. The Alliance would ask the Council to include CBOs in the training and implementation so that it could be a link between the salons and the community and they could access um, support and information that's culturally appropriate and endemic to the community rather than something mandated by the city. Thank you. Did you have additional recommendations? I did. Um, in addition, we asked the council to consider integration of the topic within the existing structures, so within the existing cosmetology and beauty schools that exist around the city to make this a part of curricula. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next presentation. Good afternoon. 
City Council members. Good afternoon. My name is Jay Young Kim. I'm the supervising attorney of the Urban Resource Institute Domestic Violence Legal Education and Advocacy Program, or LEAP for short. And I'm actually here to testify as well on behalf of the Domestic Violence Early Lease Termination Subcommittee of the Domestic Violence and Consumer Debt Working Group. Uh, just to provide some background, the Urban Resource Institute was founded in 1980 in Brooklyn, New York, and they provide services to individuals with developmental disabilities, the homeless population, and survivors of domestic violence. Our domestic violence programs are currently operating five emergency domestic violence facilities and one transitional domestic violence facility, servicing approximately 1,600 individuals annually. The LEAP, the program that I participate in, provides in-house legal services to the residents of all of our domestic violence shelters and provides technical assistance to the staff as well. The Domestic Violence and Consumer Law Group was actually founded because several domestic violence service providers had indicated that financial abuse was a growing issue amongst the population of survivors of domestic violence, but they felt they lacked the capacity and the resources to address that need. So we came together and participated in a variety of programs such as DV Clara, which provides on-site legal services at the domestic violence facilities. And the subcommittee specifically was founded and the partners of the subcommittee are the Urban Resource Institute, Sanctuary for Families, Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation, Her Justice, and the Legal Society, to, the Legal Aid Society, to convene specifically to examine how Real Property Law Section 227C could be improved to provide relief to a wider range of survivors of domestic violence. Currently, as RPLL 227C stands, it has a huge burden that most survivors are, are unable to meet. It requires that an individual be current on their rent, that they have a pending order of protection, mm -hmm. and then beyond that, they must notify the landlord and the co-tenants in writing, and then the landlord may determine that they can terminate the lease just based on the written request, but if they choose not to do so, then the survivor must actually go to either criminal court or family court or Supreme Court, I suppose, wow. if they have an order of protection in a divorce proceeding and ask that judge to terminate their lease. And so I'd like to just speak specifically on two issue, two client stories that address why this is so problematic. So as you may guess, because I'm in the shelter system, oftentimes I'm meeting people who have fled, who've chosen to leave their homes, and they come to me and ask, how am I able to terminate my lease? One individual had actually already attempted Miss A to ask her landlord to terminate the lease, and he was aware of 227C and told her, unless you have an order of protection, you go to court, I'm not going to terminate Continue. the lease. So she was current on her rent, but I explained to her if she were to file for an order of protection, she would likely be litigating the order of protection for a year in addition to the motion she would have to file to terminate her lease. And she immediately was terrified because she had completely altered her entire schedule to avoid any contact with the abuser and felt really frustrated because she knew that having this lease could potentially lead to credit issues if the landlord decided to sue her for unpaid rent or file any sort of proceeding in housing court and ultimately decided not to file the family offense petition but felt it was unfair. So that was one individual who had an issue. And even if you do have an individual who has an order of protection and is current on their rent, the legal process is so slow and burdensome. There was one individual, Miss S, who had reached out to Mr. Adler, who is unable to be here today, so I'm sharing the story. And she filed a motion in criminal court asking the criminal court judge to allow her to terminate her lease, and the landlord asked for an adjournment to allow himself to file papers and obtain counsel. And the problem is during that time, the, the survivor has to actually be current on the rent. So they, she was living in another apartment and she decided ultimately not to proceed because she couldn't afford to pay rent for two different apartments. And so we are asking, um, I just want to be able to propose the amendments that we would ask that the city council consider in addition to what's already in the resolution that they allow individuals to submit other forms of proof of their status as survivors of domestic violence beyond an order of protection or police report such as a letter from a social worker, a letter from a health care provider, a letter from any domestic violence service provider and we would also ask that there not be a requirement that they be current on their rent in order to proceed. 
I want to thank you for your testimony. Uh, the recommendations that you all are providing are very helpful. Um, the bureaucracy and the red tape is the difference between someone being able to live safely or even to be alive. And so the bureaucracy that you're describing compounded by the mental stability or the lack of stability in your mental state and trying to navigate a system that you are completely unfamiliar with has got to be one of the most challenging. I mean, to be physically, domestically, uh, violently, sexually attacked by someone that you love has got to be the greatest heartbreak and mental destabilizer in addition to um, having to navigate a very tough and slow bureaucracy in trying to achieve help. We are certainly committed here in the City Council to expediting that process. We take those recommendations seriously. Um, I want to just you know, push away all the bureaucracy that exists on our end from this is city, this is state, and this is, we're all human beings and we shouldn't, the state shouldn't be an entity that we look at it as where legislation or resolutions go to die. This should be a place where um, we should all recognize that the safety of, of, a, of an individual, a woman, a man, a family, a brother, an elder can go to for expedited help. Thank you. We'll hear from the next person. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Diane Johnston, and I'm a consumer attorney with the Legal Aid Society's Domestic Violence Project. Annually, the society handles roughly 300,000 individual cases and legal matters for low-income individuals in New York. My practice works at the intersection of domestic violence and consumer law and aims to address the unique financial issues that domestic violence survivors face. An estimated 98% of survivors have experienced financial abuse. I litigate these issues as well as other consumer matters, including rental arrears cases, on behalf of domestic violence survivors in all five boroughs. RPL 227C recognizes the need of domestic violence survivors to vacate their apartments to seek safety. And while well-intentioned, there are significant deficiencies. The eligibility requirements of being current on rent and having an order of protection bar countless survivors from relief, and the current process is long and burdensome, as Ms. Kim testified. A survivor's inability to properly terminate a lease can have serious consequences. In recent years, New York City has seen a sharp increase in cases filed by landlords to collect on past due rent. In Brooklyn Civil Court, the Volunteer Lawyer for the Day program has handled 55 unique rental arrears collection cases so far this year alone. Civil Court Claro Clinics in three boroughs have seen a spike from one such case in 2009 to 125 in 2016. These cases involve significant amounts of money, averaging $10,428 in 2016. And keep in mind that these numbers only represent the defendants who have found their way to a legal services clinic and found assistance. Because of ongoing problems with service, many of these defendants find out about these cases only after a default judgment has been entered against them. These judgments create a black mark on the survivor's credit report, one that hinders access to safe permanent housing, as well as future credit, insurance, and outside of New York City employment opportunities as well. I'd like to share the story of one of my clients who was unable to terminate her lease under RPL 227C. She moved in with her ex in 2009, um, and at the time he convinced her to sign the lease in her name along with one of his friends because he had poor credit. After moving, he became increasingly abusive and nearly killed her in March 2011. Mm. A concerned neighbor intervened, came into the apartment, and helped her flee to safety and obtain an order of protection from criminal court. She returned to the apartment only once, under police escort, and was given 15 minutes to collect what she could, while Mr. R was present, making threats, and required physical restraint by the officers. She eventually moved into a domestic violence shelter after he violated the order of protection and tracked her down at a friend's apartment. Unbeknownst to her, because of improper service, in March 2014, her landlord filed a civil court action seeking $8,400 in rental arrears because her co-tenant and Mr. R had stopped paying the rent and remained in the apartment well past the expiration of the lease. She never pursued lease termination because she feared notifying her landlord and returning to court would expose her to more violence by Mr. R. However, because she did not follow the law's procedures, these circumstances did not provide her with a defense to the action. We represented her and we're currently awaiting the court's decision as to whether she'll have to pay thousands of dollars for months she didn't live in an apartment she fled to save her own life. And again, we commend the City Council for taking actions on this resolution. Um, we have similar recommendations to what Ms. Kim laid out 
Um, but we do think this is an important step in protecting more domestic violence survivors and allowing them to safely, to safely leave these relationships. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Rosenthal has a few questions, and then we'll call up the next panel. Okay, this will be fast. Thank you so much for the work that you guys do every day in trying to do right by these people who have no resources, really, and nowhere to turn um, and are in impossible situations. So thank you for that. Um, do you have a sense of how many people um, resolution the resolution would, uh, 1292, how many people they could benefit? Are we talking about tens or hundreds? New York City. I would say thousands. I mean, honestly, because I think that given the fact, statistics show that approximately, I actually looked into this in New York State, about one out of three individuals do suffer from domestic violence. So I... I, 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 and I believe that oftentimes what happens in terms of when I see individuals in our shelters at URI, oftentimes I don't really pursue it because I ask them, are you current on your rent? And the answer is no. So that's a huge barrier. And then um, there are many individuals who choose not to either pursue an order of protection or even file a police report. Oftentimes immigrant survivors are afraid especially to engage in those systems. Or alternatively, if the abuser is an immigrant, they may choose not to go forward with a criminal case because they know that they, that may end in deportation of the abuser. So I think oftentimes, yes, absolutely. I would, I would, I believe that saying thousands is not an exaggeration because I think this would include not just individuals who speak with service providers, but if there was greater awareness because of programs in salons and things like that. I think if individuals knew, then they would pursue it if they were, had access to those services. So I would say thousands. And is that it's the woman's name on the lease? Yes. Yeah, and I would add, I you know, dealing with financial abuse, I often see situations where all of the bills, all of the liabilities are in my client's name. The abuser may have the assets in, in their name, but my client's usually left on the hook for, you know, they're on the lease because their credit is better, they're on the utilities, they're on the credit cards, you know, so at the end of a relationship, they're often left saddled with all of this debt. And you mentioned that in 25 states, as well as the District of Columbia, um, they have provisions allowing survivors of domestic violence to break their lease early. Yes. Um, and it, are those provisions e easier than an order of protection? Yes. Um, so New York is the only state, according to the research that we've done, that requires a survivor to go back to court to terminate the lease. All of the other states allow it on written notice. Um, but in addition to that, <clears throat> Um, there are nine states that allow something beyond an order of protection or a police report. There are only, I think, three other states that restrict it to an order of protection only, in addition to New York. Most states allow at least a police report. A lot of states allow some other form of documentation as well. This research is incredibly helpful. Um, thank you for your time and for your testimony. And we would be happy to share the research that we yeah. have with City Council as yes. well. Thank you, because you're going to allow us the opportunity to strengthen our legislation, but also to create different forms and mechanisms of legislation and to connect with our sisters on the state level uh, to carry these legislative matters uh, forward. So I appreciate the research that you're bringing. It's got our wheels turning. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panel will be... I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Uh, Charlena Powell, Voices of Women, Organizing Project Not for Profit. Quinia Abron, New York Women's Chambers Commerce. And Cecilia Haston. Violence Intervention Program. If I have, please correct me in your introduction. Thank you. We'll start here. And if you'll just introduce yourselves, 
Uh, and we have a three minute uh, time clock because I know we have to leave this room at one o'clock. So I will begin on my left and thank you all for being here um, and for sticking it out. I know it's been a long hearing, but we appreciate your presence and your diligence in staying here and putting your testimony on the record. You may begin. Is your microphone on? Is the red button on? No. Okay. And then just bring the microphone a little closer to you. Uh, may I start again? Please. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Charlena, and I'm a survivor of domestic violence. I would like to emphasize survivor as I'm fortunate to be standing here before you to speak with you today. Uh, there are many victims who unnecessarily meet a, tra a tragic fate. Uh, I'm a member of the Voices of Women Organizing Project, a grassroots organization of survivors of domestic violence who organize to improve the systems that abuse victims rely on for safety and justice. Uh, there are many systems whose response to survivors of domestic violence can stand to be improved, however, I'm here to advocate for the passage intro 1610 for OCDV to provide training to cosmetologists on the sign of domestic violence and available resources for its victims and their clients. It's important for us to acknowledge the crucial role that the hairstylist has and can play in a victim's life. They have they can notice signs of abuse like bald spots where their hair once grew or bruises covered up by makeup. Uh, for many, hairstylist is a confidant and individuals may disclose their d abusive relationships with. It is important for the cosmetologist to receive the proper training on the effects of abuse, its cycles, and engaging a victim so they are able to provide them with information on where to go for help. The information provided to survivors should be clear on steps as navigating New York City's domestic violence response teams can be extremely ex confusing. In furtherance, we recommend that all trainings provided by OCDV include survivors of domestic violence to provide participants in the trainings with a comprehensive understanding that what it means to be a victim of domestic violence its cycles, and how it effectively engaged victims of domestic violence from a, from a survivor's perspective. Lastly, every survivor's story is different. Every circumstance surrounding the story is uniquely written. Therefore, we cannot have a one-size-fits-all solution to, to, uh, to such complex problems. It is crucial to continue to explore ways of clearing the pathway to safety for survivors of domestic violence. Uh, we thank you, uh, Council Members Salmanaka and Rosenthal for sponsoring this important legislation and thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for speaking out about a very important issue and utilizing your own experiences to do so. Thank you. Good morning, or good morning. Is it afternoon already. Good afternoon, that's right. <laughs> My name is Kenya Brew, and I'm the president of the New York Women's Chamber of Commerce. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to testify today as, as an advocate of, of women um, in business. We have been working with um, women in the cosmetology industry since 2007, specifically with immigrant women that have come from Latin America that have studied and have worked abroad in, in the country of origin, helping them. Um, educating them on the regulations of the city and state and also helping them get their license to practice cosmetology. We have trained um, more than 6,000 women and we have helped around 3,500 get their license here in New York, in New York State. Um, and I understand um, your goal and I applaud your efforts to um, to encourage their participation in, um, in identifying and providing um, information to women that um, are victims of domestic violence. And I would even say um, further than that to um, not only to the, to the ones that have been victims, but also 
um, to, for prevention um, in, in, in um, domestic violence. But I cannot um, support the legislation as, as to stand the proposed legislation because my concern, um, I have several concerns about it. One is that these women, the, the women in the cosmetology industry, um, they themselves have been victims of, of many different um, things. Um, landlords, um, vendors, um, relationships themselves. So I have that concern. Um, so we have to be um, um, aware of, of that, the cultural as well. We have to be concerned. We have women in the cosmetology industry that come from a lot of different countries. And um, so that, that's a concern that I have. And also that the, um, the possibility of, of finding them if they don't take the training, as it is, they already get fined uh, from the Department of Consumer Affairs, as you heard a lot, which is something that we deal with every day, pretty much. And I think it will be unfair to do that. I think that we want, if we want them to participate, I mean, as already it is, they, they're in fear a lot of time when somebody works, works in a, uh, somebody from the city walks into their place of business. Mm -hmm. And that's something to take into consideration as well. So I think that if we want this to work, it has to be a different type of approach. It has to be a program, and it has to be um, not seen as regulation, um, it has to be educational. It has to be as part of a, something that they're doing for the community to give back and also as women um, to identify with women that have been victims of domestic violence. Um, and also I think that if there's a way to compensate them economically, even with a stipend, um, that would also help because if they're taking time to do the training, I think it's important. And I don't think one hour it's enough um, that we never, you know, a training, that's another thing. Um, it's just not possible for you to learn how to identify victims of domestic violence um, with one hour. Um, we, as the New York Women's Chamber of Commerce, want to um, bring that forward to you to take into consideration. I think the training should be provided by those organizations that already work with these women, that know them, that deal with them every day. And also with, um, should be also be provided in collaboration with those organizations that already provide training on domestic violence to the community. Thank you. I appreciate those recommendations. It was very interesting insight and a different perspective that we haven't heard. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just to end, I know that we're pressing time. I, um, I have here um, Angela Perez who, um, works in Queens, she has a beauty salon herself. She's the president of the um, Queens Women's Chamber of Commerce and um, she wanted to let you know that also she's willing to work with you on this and what we are proposing, maybe having a meeting with some of the cosmetologists, we'll be more than happy to bring them uh, forward um, so that you can hear from them and maybe work on, some, on, on making this really something that can work for everybody. Thank, Thank you. you, thank you for your recommendations. Uh, I'm very honored to be here, and I thank you for the time that you are giving us to do this. Uh, my name is Cecilia Gaston. I'm the executive director of the Violence Intervention Program, and I'm excited to be here today to pledge my support to Intro 1610. The creative and strategic thinking behind this legislature, the legislation aligns with the approaches that we know are successful at VIP. For years, we have been conducting grassroots and non-traditional outreach to places like churches, nightclubs, and beauty salons as a way to reach those victims and survivors that may not otherwise have been able to access information about domestic violence in available services. Many clients are referred to our program by word of mouth, and undoubtedly, her dressers are among the people making those referrals. By providing formal domestic violence training and resource information to hairdressers throughout New York City, this legislation can effectively engage thousands of people, many of whom already pay a supportive role, play a supportive role in the life of victims and survivors. In addition to voicing my support for this legislation, however, I am also here to urge the committee to consider giving culturally proficient nonprofits as opposed to city employees the resources and responsibility to provide these trainings. I say this with the utmost respect for city employees and with the years of experience in the anti-domestic violence 
movement here in the city of New York. These trainings should be facilitated by people doing work around domestic violence within the communities where they hairdresser salons are located. Hairdressers in the neighborhoods where we work have deep ties to the local community and to be able to tap into their network and build relationships with them would be invaluable to service providers, advocates, victims, and survivors alike. There is one thing I have learned all these years is that the most effective social justice strategy are grassroots and community-led. Through this legislation, the city has a real opportunity to invest in an approach of combating domestic violence that promotes the community solidarity necessary to bring DV out of the private sphere and into the light to be treated as a public health issue that it is. I thank you for the consideration. Thank you. <clears throat> Council Member Rosenthal, do you have any additional questions? I just really want to thank you all. Kenya, it's always great to see you, and I appreciate your insights. You're right. We would love it if you could help us sit down with some com cosmetologists you work with, with the Queens Women's Chamber of Commerce. Um, thank you for offering that. And Sherlena, thank you for coming and testifying. Um, I hope you'll consider sending that your testimony, and Kenya, for you too, send it to the City Council. We can give you the contact information so what you said can be put into the record um, for the city, this hearing. Definitely. It would be very powerful. It, I, would like to, I would like to express the issue that uh, we have been getting, uh, trying to get some funding to work with Connect. They have roundtables for men, and they have a model of working with barbers already. It's right. already been invented. Right. Uh, we have been already trying to get funding so that we can actually do this type of community education together, the men and the women together, because that's what's important. Thank it's you. not just a women's issue, it's right. a community issue. Right. <clears throat> so, so I definitely want to thank all of you for being here today. Your testimony um, gave us new perspective, new light, and we want to make sure that we expedite the process when a, when a victim of domestic violence comes forward. It's our role and responsibility throughout the city to make sure that that courage is met with uh, rapid response and that everything from leases are expedited. We have to just make sure that it's not legislation that we're putting forward that's not actually being expedited. So we want to make sure that the 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 testimony that you've put forward, the ideals that you've put forward, the critiques are all encompassed to make this stronger legislation. So I thank you all for being here today. Councilmember Rosenthal, yes. Right before you do that mm -hmm. last sentence. Yes. Um, Cecilia, you know, I, we've been doing so much work together on the human service contracts and making sure that they're fully funded. But perhaps what we should be pushing for is that as the administration writes their new contracts and goes into new three-year cycles, that this becomes part of the work. And that, you know, we pay, I mean, you're right, you're just the right organization or a grassroots organization in your community would be different than in Queens or in mine. So, um, putting the workload there mm -hmm. um, really makes most sense. Uh, I appreciate your testimony very much. We work with the chamber, with the Women's Chamber of Commerce, in order to do the financial empowerment that we do with our communities anyway, because they very often are the entry level positions for many of our women to own their own businesses. If you are undocumented, you are not allowed to be hired by anybody. Developing your own entrepreneurial activity is the only way to make money. Mm -hmm. So this is a critical entry-level position for many, many immigrant women. And about 42% of the city of New York of women and girls above 15 years old are foreign-born. Yeah. So these are really places where our, you know, immigrant communities really do their work and earn their pay. Thank you so much. This has been inspiring. Thank you very much. We appreciate your testimony. We appreciate your time. And we appreciate your ideas. And we're going to transform them into reality. Thank you. Thank you. 
We are now going to adjourn this hearing. Thank you for all being here today. Thank you.